Hello everyone and welcome to season two of Slick Rides Garage. So the odometer finally quit in the F-150 shop truck. It's a common problem that can be fixed. It's also a great excuse for an easy cool factory tech upgrade. Let's get into the garage. Okay, so here's the tools we need. A quarter inch ratchet, nut driver, 5.5, 7 and 8 millimeter sockets, extension bars, plus a straight and right angle pick. That's it. While we're at it, let's solve the mystery of headlight switch removal, inspect the replacement cluster, clean it all up, and restore this trash down bezel with a process I developed and make it crystal clear. But first, let's have a look at the new Slick Rides Garage skill meter. The Slick Rides Garage skill meter for this job doesn't even get to one. It's a good job for a beginner with basic safety and repair procedures. If you know your lefty loosies from your righty tighties, have a pretty basic set of tools and around a couple hundred bucks for a clean used cluster, then this swap might be for you. For this swap, the truck needs to be in neutral, so I parked it on a level surface, set the park brake, and blocked the wheels. Once the truck's in neutral, we can disconnect the negative battery cable and remove the headlight switch. The early headlight switch uses an internal slide lock mechanism that holds it to the dash. It functions automatically on installation but must be manually disengaged to get the switch back out. It's important to never pry or pull on the switch face in any way during removal. That's because it only takes a very small amount of force to shear the plastic rivets that hold it together. Now once they're gone, there's no reliable means of reassembly and therefore no guarantee of headlight control. Now if your switch has already come apart, let me save you some time here. Slide this black plastic piece to the right until it's about a quarter of an inch away from this blue dimmer rheostat and pull out the switch. To release the slide lock, turn the headlight knob to the on position and pull back until it clicks. This square cutout at the bottom is what we're looking for. Insert the straight pick here and press the release tab inside to detach the knob. This picture should help you find it. It might take a second, but once you do, it pops right off. Rotate it a half turn and lightly press it back on the shaft. Now turn the knob just like you're turning off the headlights. Push it in so it's flush with the switch face. Turn it back to the on position and make sure it stays there. At this point, the slide lock is disengaged. If the switch hasn't popped out a bit by now, you can tap on the side of the dash like this, and that'll help to open up a gap on top. Now using the right angle pick, push it in far enough that the tip of the pick contacts the mounting flange on the switch base. That keeps from pulling on the face during removal. Now make sure the headlight knob is still in the on position and use the pick to withdraw the switch. Pull the switch out a bit and detach the electrical connectors. Lift the red lock bars, depress the release tab and gently pull them out. Lift this tab to remove the last one. Set the switch in a safe place away from the work area. There's four retaining clips on the back side of the steering column cover. Pop them free with a gentle tug near the corners. The instrument cluster trim is next. A magnetic driver helps in tight spots, like this 7mm screw in the headlight switch pocket. Remove it and these six screws. There's one on the lower left, two on the lower right, and three above the column. Push the headlight switch connectors back, unsnap the left side of the trim from the dash, then move to the right and pull it free. Carefully remove the trim and set it in a safe place. To remove the instrument cluster, start with the four mounting screws. Pull the cluster out a bit and detach the shift position indicator by gently pressing this tab under the right side. It slides out of the bottom and stays with the truck. Now we can pull the cluster out a bit and detach the electrical connectors. The release tabs can be difficult to get to, and I hope this view helps. Press the tab down and carefully pull them out. I'm removing the cluster carefully so I don't snag anything on the way out or scratch the clear bezel. With a little maneuvering, it's out of there. Before buying or installing a used instrument cluster, be sure to carefully check its condition. 
The printed circuit on the back should be bright and clean with no corrosion or circuits lifting from the plastic carrier. Also be sure to check for heat damage on the entire board and the whole cluster for any signs of moisture contamination. Remember, a super clean cluster and some new light bulbs might help you avoid some double work. To remove the bulbs, turn the socket to the left and gently pull back. They're both easily checked together with a simple ohms test across the printed circuit contact points. A small amount of resistance is normal, but no continuity could equal a bad bulb or the presence of corrosion in the socket. Replace the bulb and clean or replace the socket as needed. The ones in your old cluster are the same. The resistance here is abnormally high. That's due to this damaged contact at the bulb base. A new bulb straightened it right out. Next up, we can clean the gauge face. But first, we have to remove these seven screws, then the clear bezel and a scutcheon. When cleaning the gauges, use a microfiber towel lightly moistened with water only. Never spray the gauge face or shift position indicator with any kind of cleaner. 28 years ago, I learned this the hard way when I sprayed cleaner on the printing and it all fell on the floor. Here's some other things I learned. The tag in a dirty towel will cause scratches, so tuck in the tag and turn the towel often. Be gentle and only wipe the face until it's clean. The indicator needles are very fragile and excess movement can affect accuracy or ruin the gauge. Hold them gently at the base and wipe from center to point. The same goes for the shift position indicator. A little care goes a long way. Now let's grab a dry microfiber towel and wipe it down one more time using the same precautions. Just take it easy and be careful. With the final inspection complete, let's tackle that clear bezel. Over time, scratches and scuffs on the clear bezel are kind of hard to avoid. If you run your fingernail lightly across them and they don't catch, they can be polished out with a process I developed and restored to crystal clear. Here's the original bezel from my truck, and it's definitely a mess. With all the scratches, scuffs, and spray paint on the lens, let's put the process to the test and restore this one. For the first step, we'll use California Customs Purple Metal Polish to remove the worst of the defects. Wash and dry the lens, add some polish, then buff it in with a moist kitchen sponge. Use circular strokes and moderate pressure. The inside almost never sees any wear, but it can be polished the same way if needed. I like to work about half the lens at a time. When it feels like the lens is smoothing out under the sponge, wipe the polish off very gently with a clean, dry microfiber towel. The keys to success, always wipe the bezel very gently and inspect after every step, looking through it towards a well-lit area. If the majority of defects are still there, repeat this step. If not, repeat using less polish and step back the pressure a bit on the sponge. That spray paint was tougher in a $2 steak, and the left side took three passes to remove it. This is after the first pass, now the second, and the third. When the polishing is complete, the defect should be gone, and the light swirl marks left behind will come out in the next step. For the second step, we're using 3M's medium duty rubbing compound and the same procedure. Buff it in, smooth it out, wipe it off very gently and inspect your work. Once the swirl marks are gone, we can finish it up. The final step is with 3M's Finesse It 2 finishing compound. Polish it twice the same way, then apply a small amount directly on the sponge and make one pass on the inside of the bezel. Now wash and dry it one more time and we're ready for the final inspection. Wow, what an incredible difference. After a little over an hour and some elbow grease, it's crystal clear. Now, this process was born in 1991 after I read on a can of Brasso that it can be used to polish plastic watch bezels. A few more years of development led to the process you just saw. Okay, let's reassemble the cluster. A light shot of compressed air takes care of any dust, and the gloves keep fingerprints from sticking out like a sore thumb. <laughs> Bad puns aside, just put everything back together the way it came apart. The plastic threads strip easily, so I'm only tightening the screws just past snug. The instrument cluster looks awesome, so let's install it and put everything back together. Pull out the cluster connectors and plug them in. Start with the inboard connector and move to the left. 
Move the cluster forward to snap in the last one. Carefully maneuver it into position, slide it back, then pull out the shift position indicator and make sure the return spring is still in place. Snap it into the cluster, seat the cluster on the dowel pins and install the four mounting screws. The two on the right are tough without a magnetic driver, so I'll hold the screws to the socket when I put them in place. I hooked the headlight switch and negative battery cable up temporarily to check the panel lights. We're good here, so after a little more dusting, we can carefully slide in the cluster trim, pull the headlight plugs through, then carefully seat it and snap in the left side. Be real careful when tightening the screws because too much torque will crack the trim. Slide in the steering column cover, make sure the clips all line up, then snap in both sides. Before the headlight switch goes in, let's enable the slide lock. Turn the knob to the park light position, hold the switch face to the base and gently remove the headlight knob. Turn it a half turn and put it back on the shaft. Now seat it, turn the headlight switch to the off position, Attach the connectors, secure the lock bars and carefully slide it in until the slide lock engages with a click. Push in near the edge of the face to make sure it's fully seated. I've hooked my OBD2 scan tool up to the truck's diagnostic port and set it to read engine RPM. So let's fire it up and see what happens. The tack works. And the scan tool shows it's right on. What's cool about this swap is the truck is already wired for it. It's literally plug and play. And since the truck adapts its RPM signal to the TAC, any cluster from a 1997 or 98, whether six or eight cylinder, will work with this swap. My truck is a six cylinder XL and the donor cluster came from an XL TV8. Well, I hope you enjoyed this Season 2 opener here on Slick Rides Garage. And if you did, just wait till next week. Now that's when we're starting an epic build on the classic 1988 GMC one ton. Let me put it to you this way. A simple ignition trouble code turns into an engine swinging from a cherry picker. <laughs> you won't want to miss that. So be sure to subscribe, share, and throw me a thumbs up. I'd sure appreciate it. Thanks for watching, everyone. We'll see you next week.